Okay. Welcome everyone to EduSmart's professional development series. My name is Devanshi Mather and I will be your gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous MC today. Um, I, uh, we have an amazing presentation prepared for you today with our guest speakers, Danielle and Adriana. I cannot emphasize enough how much experience and education this team brings to our table today and what valuable information they have to share with you on the topic of making sure that all of our students succeed in science. I have personally been looking forward to them uh, to present since I actually saw them present live at CASC last year. And I assure you that each and every one of you will want to join my fan club after you hear them talk today. Um, so uh, before I hand it over, just I'll be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, please put all your questions in the chat and then I'll queue them up for our presenters at our Q&A at the end. So please give your warmest welcome to Danielle Lozano and Adriana Martinez Elkmari. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are so excited to be able to present on this topic, which is very relevant to all of us now as uh, we're in the state of Texas. For those of you that are in the state of Texas, it's extremely relevant with Reading Academies as well. Uh, but this is, this, besides that, it's a very, very interesting topic. So the science of explicit instruction and in literacy is what we're going to be covering today. We're gonna to be making an emphasis on special populations. So we're looking at a vast, uh, vast uh, uh, information on a lot of topics, but we're going to concentrate mainly on our special population. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Adriana Martinez Sacamari. I'm a doctoral candidate at ACU. I have 17 years of experience in the field of education. I'm a former elementary and middle school teacher, an interventionist, and cohort leader. And I'm Danielle Lozano. I get the privilege of being Adriana's partner. I've been in education for 17 years, and I have helped support teachers in implementing explicit instruction in their lessons across contents. I'm also a Reading Academy cohort leader, and I love supporting teachers in using reading and writing strategies in all subject areas. All right, so today we have an exciting agenda for you covering what explicit instruction is and why it's important, how to use it in science, as well as comparing discovery to explicit instruction and how to use explicit instruction and how that helps all students, but especially our students who think and learn differently, such as our multilingual students, our SPED and 504 students. And we'll also learn how EduSmart can assist in scaffolding the needs of our students. So what is explicit instruction? Explicit instruction is systematic, it's direct, it's engaging, and it's success oriented, and has been shown to promote achievement for all students. It breaks up learning into smaller parts, and lightens the cognitive load on how much brain resources a student needs to process information. And a lighter cognitive load is really gonna free up that working memory. And that's important because Learning new skills requires a lot of working memory. Teachers tell students what they need to do using direct explanation, along with sharing and modeling new, new knowledge. So using this type of direct structure and instruction is really gonna make your lessons crystal clear. So what does explicit instruction look like? Explicit instruction is characterized by a series of supports or scaffolds where students are guided through the learning process. And on your screen, you can see some examples of what explicit instruction can look like in a classroom. From front-loading vocabulary terms before students read a text, we know that front-loading these vocabulary words will strengthen vocabulary, it strengthens comprehension, and it helps students be successful readers. Learning strategies, that helps students comprehend difficult text. In, for example, in math, um, we teach them those small steps. We're segmenting the complex skills into smaller instructional units of new material, addressing concerns as we go. And once they've mastered, then their units are synthesized. So we move from those simple math or science computation to a more complex word problem, for example, and then to the multi-step word problem. 
Another example is writing. Simply telling students to edit their writing before publishing does not mean they understand the writing process. They need to be explicitly taught the writing process and at each level they need to understand that it is a multi-step process. So let's look at an example. Um, when we're talking about a process, so on the next screen, there you go. So when we're talking about a process such as photosynthesis, students must first learn that plants are producers, meaning they make their own food. They must first understand that plants need water and sunlight in order to be able to produce their own food in a process called photosynthesis. It is not until students understand that one, plants make their own food, two, plants need sunlight and water to make their own food, and then three, they, the food they make processes uh, take place in the leaves. Once students understand these three basic concepts, then we can move into a more in-depth process and what is happening. So this is an example of how explicit instruction breaks down teaching concepts into smaller and easier um, parts to understand. And on the next screen, you'll see that students understand that plants need sunlight and water to grow and that they make their own food, that they can learn that their food can make is in the form of sugar and that during photosynthesis, plants take in carbon dioxide from the air into the leaves of the plant and oxygen moves out of the plant's leaves as a byproduct of photosynthesis. So once students understand this, Teaching can move into other concepts like carbon oxygen cycling and the effects on humans and other animals. But again, the concept from must start simple and move into the complex. So the importance of practice. In order to promote initial success and build confidence, we regulate the difficulty of practice opportunities during the lesson. We provide students with guidance in skill performance. When when, do students, when students are demonstrating their success, you gradually start decreasing your level of guidance while increasing the task difficulty. Students need adequate time to practice a skill before independent implementation. And when students don't have enough practice, what happens? What, what would happen to any of us? We would feel frustrated. We would feel confused. So with enough practice and explicit instruction, students have the necessary foundation to add on to their new learning. So now we're going to be looking at the steps to plan for explicit instruction. So the first thing you need to do is you need to state the objective in clear and concise student learning language. Having a clear objective helps you plan your explicit instruction, helps you plan out the scaffolds and the steps that your students will need to clearly understand what they are learning and why. They're also going to need to provide clear direction and understanding or and clear directions and instructions. So using language that is clear, concise, and consistent, focusing on the critical parts of the content and academic vocabulary, and having clear directions and expl explanations takes out the guesswork. So they're not having to try and figure out what, you're, what they're doing. They get stuck. Modeling that self-talk is very important, especially for our students who think and learn differently. They don't know where to begin. They don't know how to accomplish a task. So like I said, they get stuck and they just sit there. Another thing that we need to make sure that we're doing um, for another step is connecting the lesson to something students already know. So something like, remember when we did this, remember when we read about this. Activating that prior knowledge and that background is so important in students understanding because it helps make connections to the new information. By using what students already know, it helps you, the teacher, assist students with the learning process because it gives them an idea of what students know and what they still need to learn. We also need to make sure that they have the gradual release of responsibility. We often look at the gradual release model for explicit instruction as the traditional I do, we do, and you do. So with the I do, the teacher models, states the objectives in kid-friendly terms and give directions in appropriate academic language. The we do will be where we spend most of our time. Students will practice the skill with lots of support. And you can also add an extra step. I like to add a they do. So they go from the I do, the we do, we do it doing our guided practice together. Then they go to the they do with partners continuing that practice at a table group. 
And then finally, you have the you do where they do the task on their own, reviewing and practicing, and then receiving specific and purposeful feedback. Another, the next step is providing opportunities for ongoing review and practice. Explicit instruction, whether it's in small group or whole group, helps all students, especially those who need intensive intervention, including those with learning disabilities. You might have them um, called tier two or tier three intervention in your district. So these students usually need to practice a skill 10 to 30 times more than their peers. Explicit instruction not only gives students opportunity to practice, but it also gives you a structure to make sure learners are capable and successful as they practice. When we say practice, that can include guided practice. Maybe you might work through several problems as a class, correcting errors as you go. Through guided practice, you have the chance to make sure that every step is clear to students so that they are ready to work independently. If students haven't grasped that skill, you can model and verbalize it often and over and over again until they do get it. So practice can also include rotations and stations, can include technology, it can include partner work. The key is that students need to practice this skill for it to stick into their long-term memory. And then once students are successful with the guided practice, the we do, they do, you move on to that independent practice or the I do. This is when that skill or strategy becomes fluent. Resist the urge to introduce more difficult material. You're gonna to wanna to stay focused on the independent practice tasks that align with the skill that you're modeled. Students should master this task during their independent practice to 90% of the time before you add on the more complex skills. And then after that, after the independent practice, you're doing that cumulative review. You're mixing both the old and the new skills and the new knowledge. That's, that review is what's going to help the students gain that automaticity. So making sure that your students are just consistently needing that repetition and that practice. And then last step that we would look at today is going to be ongoing specific and purposeful feedback. As your students engage in guided and independent practice, give them that immediate and actionable specific feedback. So that might sound like if maybe they, instead of saying, no, that's not right, you would say for science, you would say, you wrote that plants produce oxygen, but you were supposed to write that they produce, or what do they produce that they can ease? So this will guide students to success, reduce the chance that they'll practice a skill or a strategy with errors. So when you're moving around the room, make those informal observations, put it on your clipboard or in your iPad to record your observations so you can give that timely feedback. And this will also help you make decisions about instruction um, on what that student needs next. So we're going to talk about the principles of explicit instruction. First thing we're going to talk about is optimizing engagement time and time on task. This is the time students are engaged in activity, and this includes listening to the teacher, solving a problem, and listening to other students. We're also wanting to, another principle is promoting high level of success. As I mentioned earlier, optimizing engaged time has a positive impact on student learning. However, it is when students are both engaged and successful that they learn the most. Just being engaged in a task or performing a skill is not useful if the percentage of errors is high, meaning that students are spending their time practicing it the wrong way. So although errors and mistakes can happen at the beginning in the initial instruction, you can make learning more efficient for students by minimizing and correcting those errors as soon as they occur. Another principle is increase the content coverage. The more content that is covered well, the, cover, the greater the potential for the student learning. So to break it down, we could say the more you teach, the more they learn. A number of decisions affect the quality and quantity of content coverage, including what to teach, how to teach it, and how it will be practiced. The more direct and parsimonious the delivery of instruction is, the more content will be covered. The other principles are have students spend more time in instructional groups. Grouping for instruction is typically accomplished by putting students into groups based on their instructional needs or their current functioning level. We do have heterogeneous groups and sometimes there are advantages for certain instructional outcomes, but grouping by academic skill level allows students to learn the skills most appropriate for them and increases their success. This type of grouping should be used flexibly and it should also be based on their needs and change and definitely change with time. 
And then we're going to continue on and we'll talk about scaffolding. Scaffolding is another important principle. It's an effective approach for ensuring success and building confidence for students while they're learning because it provides the needed support that helps bridge that gap between current abilities and the instructional goal. We also address the different forms of knowledge. The ability to strategically use academic skills and knowledge often requires students to know different sorts of information at different levels. For example, we have the declarative level, what something is, the factual information. This might look like when you're asking them to name a letter, they can do it accurately. When you're asking them um, what is six times four, they can say it or write the correct product. When asked about the months of the year, they can say them in order. The other one is procedural level. This is how something is done or how it's performed. So this is solving two-digit multiplication problems, determining the main idea of a paragraph or writing a persuasive essay. And then we have conditional level, the when and the where to use the skill. Conditional is being able to decide when to use a question mark to, at the end of a sentence or knowing when to borrow from the next column in a subtraction problem or knowing which reading comprehension strategy to use based on the genre. And the reason we describe these forms of knowledge is to stress that you do not own, you, sh you not only should teach that something is, but whenever appropriate, you should also teach how something is done and when to do it. When you convey all three forms of knowledge to your students, they are much more likely to become independent, self-regulated learners. And now I'm going to pass it over to my amazing teammate, Adriana. Hello, hello. Um, well, we're going, the next thing we're going to be talking about is how explicit instruction is relevant to science. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the two types of schools later on in, um, in our presentation. But explicit instruction is very beneficial for novel, no, novice uh, uh, students, students who are newcomers to the country, students who have, have not had any formal science education or who have been the typical the typical student that has gone from second grade all the way to fifth grade without really doing science <laughs> because first they need to learn how to read and they need to learn how, how to do other things and a lot of the time science is one of those subjects like social studies that kind of gets brushed aside let's be honest as a fifth grade teacher i often got students that that made it all the way to fifth grade and i wonder how did you make it here you know, you, you know absolutely nothing. And then it becomes a really stressful situation when we know that we have to prepare these students to take a state exam and they are not ready because they don't have that background knowledge to really understand the test at the level that is asked. So here is where you would apply explicit instruction. Explicit instruction is going to be beneficial for these kids that are missing that big knowledge of um, that big foundation. Allowing them to to have to get this information through explicit instruction allows it to to build a foundation that can serve as a stepping stone so that they can access knowledge that is applied at a higher level like the like the knowledge that is applied in the test um, special education teachers and interventionists working with struggling students the body of research supports that explicit instruction is more beneficial to students as opposed to discovery because if they had enough knowledge to be able to benefit from discovery instruction, they wouldn't be struggling. The fact that they're struggling is because they have nothing to attach it to. Yes, they can successfully participate in the lab. Yes, they can have a lot of fun in the lab. Yes, they can tell you what happened with the objects or what they observed. But can they tell you the why? Why did it happen? What do you know? Can they use the vocabulary? Can they explain to you? Can they write a critical writing piece? based on the observations that they had? Can they tell you whether they have, their hypothesis was successful or not and use the academic terms to explain what happened? A lot of times the answer is no, because they are missing that foundational piece. They have to have that foundation to understand what is happening in discovery. And so for special education students, for, for students that are struggling with dyslexia, these steps have to be broken down into smaller pieces that are easier to understand um, and that help build that foundation so that they can eventually understand these more abstract concepts. And so explicit instruction is broken down into two sections. 
We have the delivery of instruction and we have the design of instruction. So when you're designing uh, your lesson plans, you have to pick content to teach that is important. So go through your TEKS, look at the most difficult TEKS, look at TEKS that are embedded into other TEKS and, and pick these TEKS that you know year, year after year your students struggle with and then break them down into smaller chunks of learning and then teach this content directly to your students. Um, you want to you want to break it down into smaller pieces that they can understand that serve as building block for more knowledge to come. Then, when you're doing your delivery of instruction, you have to be very pur purposeful and understand that this and this uh, delivery of instruction must be interactive. I do something, you do something, you do something, I do something, but it has to be a back and forth. You can think of it as a as a tennis match. And you're, the ball is in your court, and I'll send it back. And it's a back and forth dynamic between the teacher and the student. And it's also feedback rich. So if in the process of us practicing, we, we, encounter, a, we encounter a mistake, we address it immediately. And then the ball is in your court. Okay, let's do it again. And we keep on doing that. And this pace, this process of back and forth, is there, it has to be adequately paced. It's not a process that takes a long time. It doesn't take a lot of days. It's back and forth consistently within the lesson. Um, and within your lesson, you also have to have three types of practice. You have to have practice that is deliberate. So deliberate practice, practicing with a purpose. What are they practicing for? Is the work they're doing related to the skill you're trying to teach them? Or are you embedding all kinds of other things that they lost uh, track of what they're supposed to learn. And a lot of the times this happens because you want to make these questions so high rigor and they're not ready for it. So the kids forget what they're learning when they're trying to figure out what the word problem you gave them means. So it's being deliberate and, deliberate and purposeful in the type of practice you give your students that is aligned with the skill you want them to learn. And then you want to practice and space it over time, not all in one session. You have to keep practicing and practicing the skill. That means that when you're done, for example, with the if you're teaching the unit on landforms, when you're done teaching the, the unit on landforms, your knowledge doesn't stay in that unit and you move on to another thing. No, it means that you're constantly spiraling their knowledge on that. When they learn about landforms, then the next they learn about um, rapid and slow changes, you bring, you bring it back in. When they learn about weathering and erosion, you bring it back in. And you keep on spiraling and spiraling this knowledge back again, again, and relating it to what they already learned about landforms so that they internalize this knowledge. So once you learn something, it doesn't go away. It comes back in situations and work problems. You allow them to point out what they know. You allow them to to keep on retrieving this information over and over. Even if you're not learning about that unit anymore, the fact that they can demonstrate their learning is a very positive thing because they're able to retrieve that and then they engage in consistent practice with that. So that's a process that we need to make sure that we change our thinking on that. And I know this, it's very hard when we have a lot of content to cover and they know nothing, but I assure you that bringing it back and helping them make those connections is going to click for them. It's going to grow those dendrite connections and snap them in place so that they can see the connection and they can apply their knowledge at the higher level. So then this brings us to two, two schools of thought. So for a long time, there's been two clubs, <laughs> the explicit instruction club and the discovery club. And a lot of times these were taught, thought to be mutually exclusive. You were either an explicit instruction person or a discovery instruction people. Uh, the, the, the discovery people thought, no, only higher learning can happen at discovery. And the explicit people thought, no, you can't understand any of that until you have the basics. And they never got to move on. Well, now we know that these two can coexist because they exist in the continuum. These two types of teaching can indeed coexist. And in your classroom, you're going to understand that you have that continuum in your class. You have kids that are very high, that are very interested in science, that have been taught science like they should have all the years, and then kids that totally missed out. So you have to be able to address these two types of populations in your classroom. And knowing that the research supports that there's a continuum and that these two can coexist is good news for everyone.
So for novice learners, learners who lack that body of knowledge, it is necessary first for them to understand the new content in order for them to see what explain what um, discovery can uh, make them learn through that process. They have to have that foundation, and we have to give them that foundation through direct teaching. And those students that have a strong background, that have lots of skills and have lots of information about a topic, and maybe they are even GT in science, they can benefit more from discovery uh, because they they are able to make those connections. They're able to take their foundation, click it with the new information and grow from it. Something that students that are missing that, that are missing that body of knowledge can't do and just get stuck. So these students benefit more from discovery, but we have to get them to a place where they can benefit from discovery. And this is the continuum that I was telling you about earlier. So in this learning continuum, we have explicit instruction and we have discovery on one end and explicit on the other. So for students that are novice learners, tier three learners, they're gonna benefit more here from explicit instruction to build that body of knowledge. We're developing that foundation. Your special education students, your dyslexia students, they're going to fit in here. And I separated dyslexia and 504, even though dyslexia is technically 504 in most states, uh, because of the implications with reading. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. But um, for novice learners and tier three learners, they're gonna benefit more from, from explicit instruction, special education, dyslexia, explicit instruction. And then we get here to 504 and tier two. Now this is going to be uh, in, right in the middle and it could go either way, explicit instruction or discovery. And it just depends. This is going to be your call as a teacher. Some 504 students have no disability that affects their, their knowledge of a subject. And it might be just a physical 504, it might be asthma, it might be something else that has nothing to do with content. So then you would make that determination of where you're going to place them. Some of your tier students might just be lacking the vocabulary and know everything else that happens. So that can tell you, does, does uh, your tier two have to be here in explicit instruction or do they have to be here in discovery? Then you have your tier ones who have had a solid foundation from second grade on up and they know the vocabulary. They're excited about science, even if they're not excited about science, but if they have the foundation, <laughs> you can move them on to, hopefully they're, they're excited about science. Um, you can move on to, to discovery where they can expand on that foundation. And then you have your students that have extensive knowledge and that are GT that they're definitely over here in discovery. However, once your students can, does it mean that once they're in explicit instruction, they stay here? No, it's a continuum because these students can move out of explicit instruction into discovery. And just the same, if they're in discovery and they're just not getting it, they can move back into explicit instruction. So that's the beauty about the continuum and, and, learn, and thinking about this type of teaching as a continuum rather than just an ex two different explicit forms of teaching that, that don't relate to each other because they do. One serves as a foundation for the other. And when we're talking about reading comprehension, it's important to take two to talk about two main parts, the process of mapping phonemes and graphemes and oral knowledge. And we're talking about this because this truly affects our dyslexic students um, at a higher rate than, than uh, our, our, our regular students or students that are sped but have another disability. Um, oral knowledge includes things like language and um, the language the student speaks, their background knowledge and the vocabulary they're familiar with. And this is important because we often, um, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions with what dyslexia actually is and how it affects students. But it's important to know that like in the, the part of our brain that handles uh, reading was really not intended to do reading. We weren't pre-wired to learn how to read. Um, that's something that we developed. And in that area, we developed that where, where we developed our ability to read, um, it was really meant for us to recognize symbols to recognize things around in our environment from a long, long time, millions of years ago, it was more important for us to know how to hunt, how to, to see when danger was approaching us than to be able to read. We haven't been reading but for the last 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. And it hasn't been that long since we've been reading. And back then, we nobody would even know if you, if you were dyslexic or not. I'm dyslexic myself. I'm like, hmm, I wonder how life would have been back then. But <laughs> now we have, to, we have to teach these kids to read. And one big difference that we need to know is that 
these students often um, confuse letters, but they don't confuse letters and, and see them backwards because they're dyslexic. They confuse letters because they have trouble attaching the phoneme to the grapheme. And, the, and, and this happens to all kids developing, read, developing reading. But with, with dyslexic students, they stay in this development to reading for a longer period of time. So when you're teaching dyslexic students, it is important for you first to make sure that you front load vocabulary, that you break down the word into prefix, suffix, and base, and that you um, enunciate in, uh, the words correctly. And they do it as well. They have to be able to pronounce the word in order to attach meaning to the word in their brain. If they can't pronounce the word, and this is not just for dyslexic students, for all students. If they can't pronounce the word, they can't attach meaning to it. So if we don't take the time to teach them these words, to model the correct pronunciation of these words, to tell them about the parts of this word, it's going to be very hard for them to attach what they know about language, their background, or vocabulary, or anything that attaches meaning to, to their words they learn. So it's very important for us to know that and consider that when we're dealing with special education students as well or um, dyslexic students to always take in that into consideration. We might think a lot of the times when we get to the upper grades, fifth grade, eighth grade, that this is a two, this is a very low level skill. But when you think about the benefit that it's going to have later on, you're going to start, it needs to be part of your vocabulary routine because you need to address these populations as well. Now, because of uh, trying to put all special education students in the least restrictive environment, we're going, there's been a shift and we have to be more doing accommodations for students to help them achieve, learn the same skill as their grade level peers, but in an easier way to understand it. Well, that's explicit instruction. That's what explicit instruction is. So when you compare it to modifications, um, we're not changing what they learn. They still have to learn the T's. They still have to pass a state exam. We're just making it more simple. So in a way, we're doing a common, we're, we're, we're making the process, uh, ch chunking the process into smaller pieces, which is very, very much like doing an accommodation for them. So, but this benefits not just special education students, but all students when we simplify it that way. So in the brain, these are the four areas that need to happen in order for us to understand reading. We have to have the phonological processor, the orthographic processor. So the phonological processor, we hear the orthographic, how we attach it to writing, uh, the meaning processor, how we attach meaning to it, and the context processor. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about what EduSmart already does with this. Um, in EduSmart, you have readers that, are, that read to you. Uh, for a student that's dyslexic, this can be like an audiobook that reads to them and stops for any word that they want. So this allow, helps them with the phonological processor where the orthographic processor students are able to highlight different words and just listen to that one word they need. And they're able to also look at vocabulary in a way that is animated and colorful. So their vocabulary words have animations and they have color. And this helps them with the meaning processor. And then they're able to put it into context with simple lab labs that are created with the IM Companion and EduSmart. Now, uh, putting it in context, you can use, do it in a mini lab like they have in EduSmart, but you can also totally do this in your class. But keeping in mind the, the point of the lab, what are they going to learn? It doesn't matter that a lab is so complicated because if they get to the end of the lab, and they miss the teaching point. They get it might be a very fancy lab, but if you didn't get your teaching point across, was it worth all the trouble? So we have to be very intentional in the way that labs are planned, so that it stays within the explicit instruction context of making sure that we put it in a way that is easy to understand, and it teaches to the point that we're trying to the skill that we're trying to teach. And then EduSmart also has. Um, vocabulary front loading. It will help you with vocabulary front loading. Um, and they have the flashcards that are dynamic and have simulations in them. Um, like I was telling you earlier, they're colorful. Um, teaching warming significantly improves your child's vocabulary knowledge and comprehension of text containing the words that are in intentionally taught. Uh, front loading and teaching vocabulary increases the comprehension. 
So before they're able to uh, understand a full on text, teaching them uh, vocabulary that is going to be confu confusing for them is going to help them truly once they read the passage or the or, or the uh, the book or the 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 story that you're going to be reading the um, whatever you're going whatever you guys are doing in science um, it's important for 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 students to to front load that that vocabulary because if you don't they're going to be stuck on words and then miss out on the whole meaning of what they were supposed to read. So it is important to front load that. Um, Edusmall already does that with your flashcards and, and they provide the domain specific vocabulary, which is domain three. Of course, you as a teacher, it's important for you to also cover domain two because domain two is going to be, uh, it's going to be vocabulary and they're going to see across subjects, but you can count on Edusmall to take care of your uh, tier three vocabulary for you. And then of course, we're going to talk about the importance of vocabulary routines and things that you can do to check for understanding. So checking for understanding is a critical step for students to acquire new vocabulary. It's also important to be able to be, with the, be in the teams, check their understanding, walk around, um, com uh, have conversations um, with your students. I, I just Hello? Uh, um, have conversations with your students. Um, make sure that you are, are in your teaching zone and that you're listening, that you're actively listening. So you can do this with sentence, sentence starters that can be written on the screen. They can be given, be given a sentence stem verbally. And students, um, and it's also very important that as you're developing your vocabulary routine, especially for uh, special education students, that you, uh, teach them to embed the vocabulary in their answer. Sometimes you'll be asking for a definition of a word that you're learning in vocabulary, and a student will give you the perfect answer and never use the vocabulary word. And sometimes we're like, well, yeah, you're technically right, and we give them credit for that word, and we need to, you know, spiral it back and tell them, use your vocabulary word. What vocabulary word would be, were you describing? And send them back to, to that, because if we don't, and we accept those answers, they're going to um, get into the habit of doing that. And unfortunately, their exam is not going to do that. They can explain, they have the perfect explanation uh, and not still get the answer incorrect. So getting in the habit of doing that is an important thing that we need to do for our special ed students, all students, as we build our routine for vocabulary. And of course, EduSmart has simulations. Simulations are simple. And let me, let me say this again, um, uh, EduSmart is a tool. It's not meant to replace you as a teacher. It's not meant to, it's to something for students to do alone without teacher intervention. This is meant to be a teacher-led tool that students can later, yes, do some parts on their own, but this is meant to help supplement your teaching. Uh, the simulations are simple. They're not complex. They're meant to allow students to directly see in a simplified way the concept. And then some people, um, might consider that these are too low level, but because but what you need to keep in mind is that you're doing explicit instruction, which means you're going directly to the point. You as the teacher are gonna scaffold this skill up and provide the rigor because only you as a teacher know the type of population that you have in your class. No one can know that for you. So in order for, for you to be able to address all the levels within your classroom, you need to start with the basics for everyone. And this simplifies the process through explicit uh, instruction through digital simulations. And then once students are successful, they can participate at an edge smart provided labs or teacher created labs and engage them in the discovery process. But at that point, everybody would have a basic understanding of what they're looking at, of what they're trying to see, of what they're trying to demonstrate. They have knowledge to attach the discovery part because discovery is going to allow them to grow even further in the area, but they'll be engaged and they'll know what is happening. And that's going to be the difference. Um, we want to go ahead and thank you for joining us in this webinar. Uh, I'm, I have some resources to show you, so I'm going to go through them in just a minute so that I can tell you what they are about. And so let me see. I'm going to start with this 
Uh, this is a, a just a visual planner that we made as a request from EduSmart for you for participating in this webinar. So thank you for coming here. Um, a lot of the times it's difficult to grasp your mind into how is this going to look in my classroom? How am I going to really execute this? So when you think about it, um, you know, you can um, separate your classes. You start with the objective. Your objective can be different or it can be the same for both groups, but your class is going to be divided into two groups, your explicit instruction groups and your discovery groups. But both of them are going to start with key vocabulary, vocabulary that you have to model, vocabulary that you have to make sure that you know how to pronounce correctly and that students also practice pronouncing it so that they know and can attach meaning to it. This is not negotiable for both parts, as you see. So you have to have your vocabulary for, your key vocabulary for explicit instruction, your key vocabulary for discovery instruction. And then you have here the different groups, your novice, uh, your novice learner, your tier three, your tier two, and your SPED kids listed here. And here I listed three types of practice. So in here, you're gonna jot in detail or as much as you can fit in the small graphic organizer, um, the types of practice you're going to have your students do if they're doing explicit instruction, the types of practice you're going to have your students do if they're doing discovery instruction. And of course, with everything that we do, we provide it in English and in Spanish. So this is your, your English one, but we also are going to make it available for you in Spanish. And then we have this other handout that we made for CAST last year that we thought might be beneficial to you as well. This is another type of graphic organizer that's as well that focuses on explicit uh, instruction as well. And it tells you what to place in each of the boxes and the type of feedback, deliberate practice, practice that is spaced out. So it makes you truly think and be intentional on the type of practice you're going to do for that group. I, I, for me personally, I know that when I see it in front of me and I, I, and I know I have an empty box that I haven't provided the three types of practice, and that's gonna help me make sure that I do address that. So we made uh, this for you as well. And of course it's available in English and in Spanish. And um, at this point, we have another graphic organizer here, that, uh, but this is just a simple and simple one in a, in a slideshow. That's a simple group instructional planning where you can separate your groups again, and then see how you're going to measure their success before they move up or down. So you can just fill, fill this out. It's just a simple graphic organizer. This one, we only have, we only made it in, in English. We weren't sure if you were interested in Spanish, but if you are, please let us know in the, in the chat and we will definitely make it for you in Spanish. And at this point, we're going to go to our Q&A. Wonderful. Oh my goodness. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. That was, oh, wonderful. Um, I know, like, I know that being able to differentiate instruction is becoming more and more crucial for successful science uh, classrooms, and your presentation couldn't be more relevant than it is now. If you wouldn't mind, if you could share your last slide again, so okay. if any of our uh, guests today um, would want to kind of follow up with you with more questions, they can uh, we'll certainly do that. Yes, let me put it back up again. Absolutely. And so, yes, we're going to go ahead and start our Q&A. We have about 15 minutes uh, to get all our questions through. Plenty of you have been sending in questions all throughout the presentation, so thank you for that. I'm just going to go ahead and see how many we can get through. And if we have more, um, we'll make sure to send your questions to our presenters. And with our follow-up email, we'll get your responses to them. Uh, so our first question uh, 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 to you uh, comes from one of our teachers. And um, they were wondering if you could explain more. How does explicit instruction help dyslexic students specifically? So this came up when you were talking about kind of um, how you're differentiating explicit instruction for special audiences. And they were asking for you to speak a bit more on the topic of dyslexia. Okay, perfect. So dyslexia for, for explicit instruction is important for us to, to um, 
to understand that the way that the new teaching of programs such as like Take Flight are there in themselves explicit instruction. They break down the phone into graphing correspondence so that students can digest this in smaller chunks. So that in itself is explicit instruction through those programs. So what we're doing for dyslexic students is making sure that, like I was saying earlier, that it's important that vocabulary is front loaded because, because dyslexic students have such a hard time attaching graphemes to phonemes. If they can't access that, if can't, they can pronounce those words, they're not gonna be able to have access to them. So chunking that into smaller pieces too and teaching them like, uh, prefix, suffixes, and basis to recognize these, these words is a way that we can have them first acquire vocabulary. Once they acquire the vocabulary, then we're gonna acquire meaning to it. So of course, with dyslexic students, they have trouble reading, so how can we supplement this? We can supplement this through making sure that we have assistive technology if it's possible, or that we have um, audiobooks, that are based on the content. That's why I was mentioning earlier that um, I was so glad that EduSmart did that for, for students, which provided the readers with the embedded uh, uh, audio option for students where they can control that, what part they want read to them, what part they didn't. And so, and it also allows them to have overlays. But if you don't have that available in your class, you could also partner them up with a fluent reader and have the fluent reader read, partner them up, read to the dyslexic student as well, and then have them have a discussion about what they're, what they are reading and have that, have the students synthesize what they learn. Of course, we also want them to be able to do it on their own, but if they're not ready to do that, we don't want them to miss out on the knowledge, the, uh, of gaining that understanding. So looking at seeing how, how, how this affects dyslexic students, then we need to plan into what tools can we incorporate or what different types of learning can we incorporate to make sure that all of our students are getting the support that they need. First, as a teacher, address uh, uh, making sure that you front load that vocabulary is going to address different groups of, of different populations. It's going to address your special ed students, your dyslexic students, your ELLs that are learning the language is going to address um, at least three different groups. So it needs to be part of your vocabulary practice. But then incorporating technology into your class is going to help even more by being able to adjust and differentiate those instructions for your students. Um, like I said, you can always have them, you can always create QR codes for your students where it has an audio version of it. You can read it and record it and for them. Um, you can uh, go through the books first and look at the content, preview the content with them. So that it's all about building that foundation. You're being very explicit in the way that, that you're teaching and you're chunking it into smaller pieces. That in itself is something that's done in the dyslexic programs. You continue to do that because that's part of what explicit instruction calls for. So within, within explicit instruction, just simply taking it to its simplest forms, is already doing an, an accommodation for them. Thank you uh, for that. You're welcome. Um, we have a few questions coming in all about kind of the same thing. So I'm just gonna take it. It's uh, basically asking about um, kind of uh, 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 getting your certification for coming. So I can take that question. Okay. So for those of you who are interested in earning a certificate uh, for training purposes, um, early next week, you will be receiving a recording of this presentation along with their slide deck and all of the resources that they shared with you. So even if you've come in late or missed this presentation, you will have a copy to catch up or perhaps you're like me and you're gonna be playing this nonstop all week long. Um, you will have the capacity to do that. So all of the information you need for that will be reaching you early next week, perhaps Monday. Um, and we have time for one more question. Uh, would the explicit and discovery strategies that you've discussed today apply to the 5E instructional module? Model, sorry. Uh, you can, yes. I mean, um, just even, even with just integrating the technology piece right there is going to be part of your, 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 your five E's. I mean, and you can expand even on, on that, depending on what level of instruction your students are at. 
definitely that's going to be a piece where you can integrate your technology in it and apply it different ways. One of the things that we do notice that with specialists, students, they do do well with assistive technology and with computers in general because they're easier and they're more straight to the point. So integrating technology can be something that you can integrate all throughout uh, for your different populations. You can do it with vocabulary using, you know, Quizlet. Quizlet can help you put your vocabulary in there. They can, you, they can, uh, it, it can help them pronounce the word, put the put the meaning there, put the flashcard with the, with the word on there. Um, you can use a program like EduSmart. You could use other programs like Quizlet, um, and a lot that allows you to embed the content in a way that helps them understand it and take it at their own at their own pace. You can do. Um, go formative and then assess them that way, putting, putting you putting in the content directly and then see how they're doing. So there's a lot of things that you can do while integrating technology into it so that students can be more successful. But again, it's going to be you being intentional. You can't just assign them a whole set of unit vocabulary. You have to pick and choose. In this instance for explicit instruction, less is more. Wonderfully said. Thank you so much. And that, uh, my folks, takes us to our time. Uh, before I let you all go, I want to thank all of you who have joined us today. I know this season in education is exciting and full of 100 things you're supposed to be doing. So the fact that you took time out to join us here today, I, from the bottom of my heart, want to say thank you very much. And even a larger round of applause and great thank you to Adriana and Danielle for joining us today and uh, presenting on this wonderful topic. Thank you, absolutely. everybody. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, then, I'm going to let you all go. Enjoy your Friday evenings. I hope you get to put your feet up, relax, and watch your favorite television show and just turn your mind off for the next hour. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Thank you, you all. everyone. I will Have a great see day. you all. On our next presentation is on the 11th. I will send all that information to you in the email as well. So I'll see you all then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having us. Have a great day.